And there was a time when there was a girl, one of my friends when I was with her, and um, just the thought of rape popped into my head. And I just became massively terrified. I had a huge panic attack. And I remember I screamed at her to leave. But before I screamed at her to leave, I remember I kept asking her, are you sure I haven't done anything? Are you sure I haven't done anything? So mm. that was, you know, what we could now know as reassurance seeking. Yeah. And she was like, sure, we haven't done anything. What, what are you so worried about? I couldn't explain this fear that I had. It was yeah. all encompassing. It gripped my entire body. Mm. So when she left and I tried to go to sleep, I just, images of suicide and murder just flashed into my head, images. So we know obviously OCD comes through images, urges, thoughts, feelings, whatever it might be. Mm. And that's another really big thing with mm. OCD. We don't, we don't deal with the law of attraction and mm. this idea that whatever you think will come to, come to pass. And that's, that's another really big misconception with people with OCD. They listen so much to this manifestation idea and law of attraction that it can reinforce to them in their heads that I'm going to become my thoughts. Yeah. Regardless where you sit, religious dogma needs to sometimes go because we, 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 have, we have secular treatment that triumphs over religious dogma. And that's the kind of segue, that's the place that I'm in. You have found the Thinking Mind podcast. Hello and welcome back to the podcast. This week we have with us Sean Flores. Um, Sean, is it okay if I get you to introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. How would I describe myself? Um, a professional agitator and a forward thinker, is, I think, is the way I describe <laughs> myself. I... I do public speak and I write a lot of articles around mental health. I look at the way society is now. I would say, in some aspects, a social slash political commentator. I would say that's the best way to describe, yeah, what I do. Wow, there's a lot to unpick there. Um, yeah. Hopefully we can talk about that in a bit more detail. Um, specifically today, you have come on the podcast to talk about OCD, is that right? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And do you mind by starting um, by telling me a little bit about where your journey or your story with OCD began? So, yeah. So, as do you know what it is? What's really interesting is the more I tell my story, the more I can look back with almost like a fine tooth comb and realize there were moments when it really started to emerge. Yeah. But how I describe it now would be, I started off with health anxiety. I had this really obsessive idea that I always had a, you know, a sexual infection or sexual disease and I'd go to the clinic straight away okay. and I'd get tested. But, um, and no matter what happened, if I got the tests in my hand, I would always convince myself that it wasn't true, it wasn't right. There was something, there was always something in my head that was, just trying to tell me this was not the case. Right. I must have had something. Mm. I canceled all my work plans. I canceled everything I did in life to run to a clinic every single time. If I went to the toilet and it hurt a little bit, if anything happened, I had to cancel it and I had to have an immediate answer. Okay. And what happened as a result of it, at my very worst, I paid 300 pounds for a same day sexual health test. And that's mm. when I realized there was some, I knew there was something not quite right, but I couldn't explain what it was. And I never understood that was anxiety at the time. Mm. So I, after that, I said, all right, we're not doing this anymore. We're not indulging. Clearly, we don't have anything. That mm. fear migrated onto HIV, but HIV as a fear dissipated quite quickly. Okay. And after that, um, it's, it's quite funny. I can laugh about it now, which is a good thing where, of where I am in my journey. Mm. But I had this dream. And in this dream, I saw the back of a white guy and I just saw boxes. And there was something in my brain that almost broke, you know, and, and most of us that live with OCD, we define it as a brain breaking moment mm. where I just woke up with this 100 percent conviction I was gay. Mm. Nobody could tell me anything different. I believe that was my new identity. And it, I just everything in my life collapsed there and then. Okay. I remember I went to the toilet. I threw up. I was so anxious. I was so sick. And at the time I was modeling quite a lot and I was getting a lot of male attention. And when I was getting male attention, I somehow believed that they knew something about myself that I didn't know, but that's anxiety, mm -hmm. that's rumination, mm -hmm. trying to find answers, trying to put, you know, put things together that always don't always necessarily fit. Yeah. I carried on with modeling. And at the time, when I look back, I think I slightly had an uh, obsessive idea about food. So okay. I actually always used to starve myself at some point. Um, I would try and work out with barely any calories in me. I, I would take diuretics to mm. maintain cheekbones because at the time when I was in high fashion modeling, that was the proposed look. That was what was positively affirmed to me everywhere I went. Mm. And I look back and I realize how dysfunctional that was. I would drink four liters of water in the morning. And I wouldn't eat until the end of the day. And most okay. of the time it would be things such as like salad and so much more. But going back to the OCD in particular, I kind of lived with these, 
this idea that I was gay for the next two to three years. And it was- That's a it, long time. Yeah, it was, it was an excessive rumination. I, no matter what I did, I could not stop ruminating. Mm. And it got so bad that it interfered with my sex life. And this is something that I think a lot of people don't talk about, especially with OCD. But yeah. if I was able to maintain an erection, I'd be sitting there going, well, I'm supposed to be gay. This doesn't make sense. And I said, I can laugh about it now, but at the time it was quite frightening. And then if I couldn't get an erection, I'd be, I've got erectile dysfunction. This means I'm gay. I was just constantly trying to find evidence. It was, for me, it was all about evidence, evidence, evidence. Yeah. Then there was a time when there was a girl, one of my friends when I was with her, and um, just the thought of rape popped into my head. And I just became massively terrified. I had a huge panic attack. And I remember I screamed at her to leave. But before I screamed at her to leave, I remember I kept asking her, are you sure I haven't done anything? Are you sure I haven't done anything? So mm. that was, you know, what we could now know as reassurance seeking. Yeah. And she was like, sure, we haven't done anything. What, what are you so worried about? I couldn't explain this fear that I had. It was yeah. all encompassing. It gripped my entire body. Mm. So when she left and I tried to go to sleep, I just, images of suicide and murder just flashed into my head, images. So we know obviously OCD comes through images, urges, thoughts, feelings, whatever it might be. Yeah. And, um, that was it for me. I just, I realized there's something up. I just, again, couldn't put words to it. So, so, just sorry to interrupt you, but you've been going on for how many years? Five, six years? About and, five to six years. And at no point did you seek help for this distressing, overwhelming anxiety in all aspects of your life, it sounds. So I sought out grief therapy for the loss of my father on Christmas Day when I was six, but I think that was compulsive in some elements that I've tried to keep putting it back down to that, which maybe it does have an impact, but I sought out um, grief therapy. Mm. So grief slash bereavement therapy. Mm. I sought out CBT. And the CBT that I went through was without ERP, it was useless. It, it actually made me worse. Just to interrupt, ERP stands for? Exposure, exposure Response Prevention, which, which is, is a branch of CBT. Yeah, yeah. So that happened, CBT didn't help me in any way, shape or form. And funny enough, recently, when I was looking back through the IAPT service letters, they believed I had symptoms of OCD. Mm. But that's how I know I wasn't in a place to register what was going on. I was, my mind was like a freshly furrowed field is the best way to describe it. Everything that came through to me really just affected me yeah. massively. And had you, did you know what OCD was during this period of your life? Did no. Heard much about it. So my mum and I used to watch obsessive compulsive cleanings on Channel Four. Yeah. But we never really had conversations it. about mental health at all, or what OCD could or couldn't have been. I've never really been exposed to mental health apart from when my mum went through severe depression when my dad died. So I had no concept. I realised bipolar was something almost where people's moods can be erratic, can be up and down. The same with BPD. I knew that schizophrenia came with hallucinations, but. As I've now been di diagnosed and I've, I've been in recovery and I'm being an advocate and activist, now I've had more awareness and yeah. informed of what's actually going on. But no, my only idea of OCD was from Channel 4. Yeah, I think that's, a, that's quite a common misconception that a lot of people think that OCD is around cleaning your hands. And that's not to say that some people with OCD don't have um, hand washing as a symptom of their OCD. And, and that is quite a common symptom of OCD. But as you've just described, and we'll hear a bit more about, I'm sure, later, OCD can latch onto any area of your life. And I've spoken to people like yourself that kind of describe it as a virus um, that latches on to anything and everything that it can. Is, is that, would you say that's a fair explanation? Yeah, I funnily would enough would say it's almost like living with your worst fears running on a hamster wheel. Yeah. Just constantly, almost the thoughts keep coming at you at volume and at, at intensity. Yeah. And at my worst, I could barely do anything. I'd get mm. onto a train or a bus and it'd be constant thoughts of suicide, thoughts of cutting myself, thoughts of killing myself, everything you could imagine. Mm. But I'm quite lucky to be in the place that I'm in, that I'm, I've recovered relatively and I want to go on to help other people with it. And you're right that the stagnant idea that we have of OCD comes with you know cleaning and contamination yet there's a charity OCD UK that I mm. think they remember it's 26.5 percent of people actually have cleaning slash contamination OCD which is a branch yeah. of OCD and yes OCD as a as an illness can latch on to any one of your morals and values there's race OCD which is pe people don't really talk about so yeah. there was a young girl on TikTok who posted up a video and she she put up in the video talking about her race OCD. She said she's terrified she's a racist because she has all these intrusive thoughts about racism and so much more. And people stitched her video and just said, you're just a racist. That's all you are. 
And this is what I mean by the lack of awareness, the lack of empathy. And I think we live in an unforgiving culture where people truly do not understand there's illnesses out there that affect the way our brain functions. And mm. I'm quite, as again, I'm quite lucky in the position that I'm in that I reached a place in my journey when I I was still living quite quite bad. Well, I wouldn't say badly, but I was I was suffering with OCD. And I just, I, I was had this fear, I was bipolar, I had a fear, I was schizophrenic, BPD, insomnia. I could list off and rattle off everything that I diagnosed myself with. And I just woke up and I just said, I'm gonna go and change the world. And I just woke up and just wrote my story. And from then on, I realized I wasn't the only person that suffered with these thoughts. Mm. I have, I've had a lot of men in particular reach out to me. Mm -hmm. Even just as recent as yesterday, someone said they saw my podcast and they said they're gonna go and get help, but they just wanted a phone call with me. A mm. lot of people suffer in silence. Yeah. If it's predicted one in 50 people have OCD, mm. that's 750,000 to 1 million people in the UK that live with it. Mm. And what about the undiagnosed population? And in America, the African-American population is known as the hidden population. There's a lot of work that needs to be done. Why do you think people suffer in silence? I've got a few ideas myself, but in your own words, why do you think people go so long without, um, without presenting to services? Or why do you think people don't tell other people about their OCD? Well, because first of all, you think you're mad. Like, there's no other way to put it and yeah. I think especially from the culture that I come from madness is seen as weakness and also anything that happens in your brain they almost believe you can brush it off with church or whatever your religious institution is or you can just pray it pray it out yeah. if I went to one of I'm not religious anymore but if I had gone to some of my friends and I said bro I'm struggling with rape thoughts yeah. do you know what I mean yeah I, I, I'm lucky I can laugh about it now because I know it's not who I am but Something I saw, sorry to interrupt, something yeah. I saw that was interesting is I've um, met people with paedophilia OCD sure. and they are so terrified mm -hmm. that if they tell someone that that person will actually say, well, you are a paedophile. It's, it's a really, really shaming form of OCD. It, it shouldn't be, of course, because it's OCD. They're not a paedophile. Yeah. But it's a really difficult one and you can completely understand why people wouldn't want to tell people about it. Yeah, it's a slippery slope. and. Yeah. A lot of the work I work on is trying to lead conversations forward and understanding that comes with consequences. You can't be a celebrity without a paparazzi. People are going to have negative feedback. People, I, even what some of the reels I've posted up on Instagram talking about OCD and mental health, right? I'll give you, a, I'll give you an example. I posted up about the dream that I had and someone commented and just said, you've got this because you're afraid to be gay. So I took the time away to think about it before I answered. And I said, maybe there is an element of that. The culture that I come from, Christian fundamentalism was a big part of um, Caribbean culture and it still very much is as a result of colonization and slavery. And I think regardless where you sit in the political realm, if you're left wing or right wing, you've got to admit that slavery and colonization fundamentally impacted and changed the ecology of the darker parts of the world, right? And I replied and I said, yeah, maybe it's true. But I said, for me, I believe it was more so a loss of identity. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, the comments ensued. People were quote unquote, people were trying to explain to him. The guy had OCD himself, and this shows that there's not one way to think about OCD. That just because you recover doesn't mean that you think about things in the exact same way everyone else in the OCD community does. Which is one of the criticisms that I actually have of the OCD community since being a part of it. And we, this myself and this guy we DM'd, and he sent me studies. And I don't think he thought I was going to actually read it. I actually read the studies, and one of the very first lines. In one of the studies said it is inconclusive as to whether sexual orientation OCD is as a result of homophobia. And I sent him the exact quote and he just didn't answer afterwards. So I think number one, there's a lot of uh, um, poor information, there's misinformation, and it's also what people want to believe. So when it comes to things such as paedophilia, this is a quote unquote controversial statement, but it's an illness. When you criminalize something, you don't give people a chance to actually help them. And I'm not saying they should live in society freely and there should be no repercussions for what they've done. There has to be punishment. Mm. But there's more and more research that's coming out that's proved there's something that's not quite firing in their brain. And even there's ideas that in the womb, there's something that there's, there's I think if I remember, there's connections that have started to misfire. So I, I, I sometimes think we've got to move past our biases and misconceptions and look at research, look at evidence and see how can we help people. So yeah. it's sad because I know a lot of people with paedophilia or OCD that would never speak out. Yeah. They will never speak out. I've had, I live with sexual orientation OCD 
and mainly harm OCD. My themes have changed. I've had a tiny bit of paedophilia OCD, but it just doesn't bother me. I've had a little bit of existential OCD mm. and so much more, but it's sad. And people have killed themselves as a result of OCD yeah. Yeah. because yeah. there's this idea in society that you have to have the right thoughts, that yeah. you have to have the right you know, way to think. And there's good thoughts, there's junk thoughts, you know, not yeah. everything in your brain you can believe, but this is not something in society we understand. And it's through conversations like this, yeah. we finally get to a deeper understanding of the brain. Yeah, I just want to say importantly, there's obviously, without it goes without saying, there's obviously nothing wrong with being gay. <laughs> yeah. I just want to say that. And paedophilia is a completely separate matter, but obviously there's nothing wrong with being gay. But I can understand how certain people are brought up in certain cultures where they are led to believe that there is something wrong with being gay. But I personally, um, and I hope, that, right. I, I hope that I speak on the values of everyone listening, that there's obviously nothing wrong with being gay. So, so let's go back to, you were telling me about how your OCD was latching on to multiple different th things. Mm -hmm. and, and you were starting to think that maybe you'd raped one of your friends. Mm -hmm. What happened from there? So she left the house. I tried to, as I said, I tried to sleep, had these images of suicide and murder pop into my head. I put my coat on, went downstairs and I just gave my keys to, the, where I lived, there was a COVID testing center. So I gave my keys to them and I said, I'm hearing voices because I was convinced that to go through what I was going through meant I mu there must be something not right with me. Mm. And I remember I was crying in a corner somewhere and I was just like, I'm hearing voices. I've messed up, my life is done, I'm over. Then suddenly I was okay. Once I was out of that panic, I was okay. Mm. The mental health team came to check for me and I said, no, I'll be okay. So I'll go to psychodynamic therapy. Mm. And we know psychodynamic therapy for OCD is probably the worst thing. You don't need to get to the root of your thoughts. You need to stop the OCD cycle. So I started seeing this, this psychodynamic therapist and I just felt terrible. After every single session, it was, we were questioning so much as if I didn't live with so many questions. In my head, I was a philosopher in so many different ways, but I wasn't philosophizing life. I was philosophizing my existence, essentially. And it was when I was out with one of my friends, again, I remember I was sitting on the bus and almost as if I'm sitting in front of you, there was just thought that popped into my head, fight him. And it, I was like, no, 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 there's something up. Got off the bus, had a big breakdown. I said, no, I'll be okay. I've been through this before. I know what to do this time. So we went to this shop. And in the shop, just suicide images, images of me jumping off a bridge, thoughts of me um, killing myself came into my head and I just said, I can't do this anymore. I jumped into an Uber, I was super, depression hit me pretty much like that. Um, I looked at my friends dead in the eye when they came to my house and I said, I just don't wanna be alive anymore. And my friends were crying because I'm usually the friend they go to that gives them the advice, I'm usually the strong one. So they didn't know how to help me. Yeah. And for the next couple of days, I, I didn't wanna be alive. Um, I wanted time to swallow me up. I felt like my existence was a burden. I didn't eat, I barely could sleep. I remember I called Samaritans three days in a row because I was living with um, a lot of suicide, cutting myself thoughts. And I remember there was a moment when I said, if I don't sleep, I'm going to wake up and take my life. And I was contemplating how to do it. I was thinking, do I put books in my bag? Do I jump off a bridge? Do I get a gun? Do I t t overdose on pills? And when I woke up, I was like, wow, why was I thinking like that? I was crying my eyes out. And then it was on Saturday the 4th of June. Of, I remember I typed in on the internet, why am I having thoughts, but I don't want to act on them? Why can't I get rid of these thoughts? OCD, obsessive, intrusive thoughts, they all came up. I looked at support groups, but support groups are sometimes the worst place for somebody with OCD. Because it's, I'm gonna be honest with you, not in a mean way, but it's quite a miserable place. Mm. It's everybody complaining about it. And I've opened my recovery group and it's not that kind of place. We talk about certain things and we move on. It's all about moving forward and understanding that we're gonna live with this, it's not gonna go anywhere. But going back to that, I found this therapist via the internet called Emma Garrick, her otherwise known as the Anxiety Whisperer, and I just begged her for a phone call and it was on Saturday, so she wasn't working. And she picked up the phone and I just started crying my eyes out. I said, what's wrong with me? Am I a bad person? I need help. I said, please, can you help me? And before that call, I spoke to the NHS and I, I asked, can I get pushed up further on the list? I said, I can't cope with what's going on in my head. They said they couldn't push, push me up any further on the list. And they suggested a book called Break Free from OCD. But when you're in an, a place, you can't take on information, right? Yeah, how can you read when you have constant intrusive thoughts? <sighs> yeah, I, I couldn't do anything. I yeah. quite literally could not do anything. Yeah. And um, I, when I spoke to Emma, I, she just said, Sean, you have OCD. 
or straight off the bat. I said, how do you know? How do you know I'm not going to act on this? You know, reassurance seeking, constantly asking questions. Yeah, absolutely. And she, she has lived experience of OCD as well. And um, we started therapy on Monday. And that, that was my recovery since then. So... And when you say therapy, was that CBT? With CBT, exposure, ERP, response, and prevention. ACT. So acceptance and commitment therapy. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, Which that was a so... key ingredient as well. But having a therapist who cared about me but was cruel to the OCD was a fantastic relationship. Yeah. And I think probably quite a lot of people listening will want to understand how you can put exposure response prevention into action with someone that has OCD around hobophobia or mm. things like that. Are you able to explain yeah. exactly what Emma got you to do? Because I think some people may be shocked, but this this is the treatment. Absolutely. Very, very good evidence. And yeah. I've, I've seen it work on many, many people. I think there's an 80 percent success rate. And I think I was reading a study last night that said, in as short as four weeks, CBT with ERP has had has profound effects on the brain, but 12 weeks has an even more profound effect. Yeah. So for me, some of my exposures around homophobia would be, I'd have to chill with my gay friends. And you know what's funny? One of my gay friends, I remember when I called him up in the past and I said, bro, I think I'm gay. And he said, no, you're not, Sean. <laughs> and he, and you know, he, him and I would laugh about it now, but when I opened up to him, he opened up to me. He has paedophilia OCD. Really? Oh, he gosh. opened up to me and I said to him, why didn't you tell me sooner? He said he didn't want to tell me anything because he wanted me to figure it out for myself because he said he thinks it could have made it worse. So when he came around, I was having all the, every gay thought you could imagine, um, suck him off, do this, do that, all of it. And him and I laugh about it, but he said, good, Sean, keep getting triggered. Keep sitting with the thoughts, they're going to go eventually. Yeah. So that was one thing. Mm. If I went to the sauna and steam room and I could acknowledge a guy was good looking, I just had to sit with the thought, I had to sit with the discomfort. How amazing you had a friend that did that for you. Yeah, absolutely. It's Because you, ha it, it's very difficult to get your head around. And, and that's yeah. coming from me as a psychiatrist, but really difficult. But how wonderful you had someone that understood what you yeah. were going through and was able to support you like that. Absolutely. It, it was a huge ingredient. He helped me in so many ways. When I didn't want to do things, I spoke to him and I was like, bro, I'm struggling, man. He said, you got to do what you got to do. And what's really important is to have someone, as I said, who's kind to you, but cruel to the OCD. Because mm. I often mm. say to people that- when It's very you... hard balance to get. Absolutely, but I often say to people that, if you allow your anxiety to take from you today, you take another day out of your future. You don't set yourself up great for your brain in any way, shape or form. And so that was one of the exposures. And one of the exposures I had to do around rape was, um, so I had to write this script of how I did it. So you know scripts, right? Yeah. So scripts, you put yourself into the scenario that you have this worst fear of. So I had to write how I did it, who I did it to, how I got away with it, where I left them. And I'll never forget, just writing the words alone brought tears to my eyes. Mm. I was so terrified I could become something like that, that I didn't even want to write the word. And as I was writing, I was just crying my eyes out. And I said to my friend, do we need to do this? Do we have to? I said, I can't take it. She said to me, Sean, you've got to do this to get your life back. And it was one of the toughest things I ever did. I fell asleep straight after. And I was like, why am I so terrified about that word? So it takes a lot, a lot of time. It takes a lot of work. But it's been so important for me. Even when I have anxiety attacks and so much more, it's about learning to sit with the anxiety. And I often yeah. say to people, anxiety has a peak and it will drop. Yeah. anxiety cannot sit at 100% it mm -hmm. can't it's impossible yeah it's absolutely impossible it's exhausting so. oh it is it is and I'll give you an example when I went out with some of my friends who also have OCD we all met up and two of my friends went off they had to go back to wherever they were going and I was chilling with one of my friends and I had this anxiety attack but I didn't realize it was an anxiety attack at first it was freezing cold outside but I was sweating mm, yeah. I felt like I was being cooked yeah. and I felt my forehead and I said all right we're in an anxiety attack. Mm. I was having all the thoughts of go home, run home, don't do this, don't do that. I just had to sit with it. Mm. I felt lightheaded. I felt like I was going to pass out. I sat with it. Sat down a little bit and I kept going. I kept going. And eventually it went. And that's what I say to people that if you can handle the discomfort and the uncertainty that it brings, you can get through the rest of it. But it's not easy. Yeah. No. I absolutely acknowledge it's not easy. But when you get through to the other side of recovery with OCD, there's nothing you can't handle. I think another thing you mentioned that, that's really important and it, I'm very encouraging of anyone listening to this suffering with OCD is to get help is because those around you that love you, um, they, they might know that you're suffering with OCD, but a lot of loved ones might encourage the behaviours, not willingly, but because it's so horrible to see someone that you love 
being distressed with their OCD and their intrusive thoughts. And loved ones can sometimes accommodate that by offering reassurance or doing something for the individual struggling with OCD to allow their rituals or to encourage their rituals. And I think the key reason why you need a therapist is because that person can impartially allow you to sit with the anxiety without with knowing that it's making you better and because they don't love you in a way that maybe your family or your friends do they can enable you to sit with that anxiety and that distress which is going to be awful initially and it gradually gets better like you said but that's why you need a therapist because family and friends it's impossible to see someone you love go through that much distress sitting through the anxiety in the erp the cbt erp do you agree absolutely i i I agree. And one of my friend calls me, the one that struggles with paedophilia OCD, he's like, bro, I'm scared that I'm this. I'm like, yes, you are. Yeah. And he goes... It's so hard to do, though. And good he goes, for you being able he, to And then that. he goes, no, I'm not. I said, have a good day. I, was, I cut the phone off. But it's, it's about the same with me in the sense of when my, when, I, when my friends were like that, it felt horrible, but they mm. did the best thing for me. Yeah. Sometimes the best medicine is the most bitter one, quite often. And yeah. I think especially if a lot of my other friends who I've spoken to are dyspraxic, ADHD, OCD, you know, all these other different illnesses, sometimes it does. it's really hard to be like that, but I know it's going to give them something better. Mm. And since my story, I've been able to create a WhatsApp group with 36 of us now who are black with OCD, which is huge. Because people from my community do not speak up about OCD. Or don't know what it is as well. Yeah, they don't know what it is in any way, shape or form. And I think, I was talking to somebody else about this, that I think quite often when people go, I'm so OCD, I think they don't really know what they're saying. I think what they, yeah. they're technically trying to say is they, they're OCPD, which is obsessive personality disorder, right? Obsessive compulsive personality yeah, disorder. And yeah, and I think that's what people don't realise, the distinction between the two. Yeah. Obviously, obsessive um, compulsive personality disorder affects the people around you more so than it does you. Whereas with OCD, it's more an internal battle that you're going through. That's how I would usually differentiate between the two. They're two and they're distinct. And maybe we could get someone on the podcast to discuss OCPD because it is difficult to get your head around the Mm. two of them being different. But you're exactly right. They are very different. So, yeah, and it is it's hard to be tough on people, but learning to have the right balance with people has been fantastic. And. I'm quite, again, I'm lucky and I'm privileged and I'm I'm thankful and I'm grateful for the place that I'm in because I didn't know I was going to make it out of where I was last year. I think some people don't appreciate because in media and, and on TV, we see OCD, like I said earlier, as hand washing and contamination. I don't think people appreciate how debilitating OCD mm-hmm. can be. And we've actually had quite a few people come on the podcast and talk about it. So I hope our listeners are gradually um, understand, being able to understand just how distressing it is. But when it becomes all encompassing, like you described, of course it can lead to suicidal thoughts because how can you live with those constant intrusive thoughts? I, I completely understand. Yeah. yeah. And, I, and I'll give you an example. I remember when I became obsessed about being depressed. So when I couldn't sit with an anxious feeling, I had this thought that said I'm depressed. So what I, so used to rumination begins and how it starts with the thought, I'm depressed. And then I go, I'm not supposed to be outside. I should be in my bed. Why am I not acting like I'm depressed? And then what happens is you end up becoming depressed because Mm. you believe the thoughts, right? Mm. So when I messaged into the group and I said, guys, I'm depressed. They said, Sean, that's rumination. Drop it like it's hot. I said, oh yeah, you're right. <laughs> and then back to normal. Because it, 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 having people there that hold me accountable and responsible has been a big part of recovery now. Mm. When you can have all the tools in the world, but sometimes you might fail at picking up your own tools and some other, someone else can really help you. So I'm really lucky, but you're right. It can, it can generally kill people. Yeah. And yeah. I think people with OCD have a higher suicide rate. I think it's about 10%. I'm not exactly sure, but I think the suicide rate is higher in OCD Mm -hmm. and body dysmorphic disorder, which is slightly linked to, it's even significantly higher. Um, I wanted to get back to the script you wrote. I don't know if Professor David Veal talks about this on his podcast when he comes on with us, but I just thought, enable for our listeners to understand exactly what that feels like when you had to write the script of rape. Um, I know Professor David Veal often says, if you've got anyone on the street to write down, you're nodding, you must have heard this before. No, I I laugh because I can imagine what it is. Yeah, so if if you ask anyone on the street to say, my mother's going to die today, or I'm going to kill my daughter today, they won't want to do it. And these are people without OCD. Mm. But that feeling of not wanting to write it down, knowing it wouldn't happen, because people with these OCD, the majority of, know it's not actually going to happen. But the knowing that it's not going to happen doesn't change the feeling of dread, fear and anxiety. So I would just ask our listeners, if, if you imagine yourself writing down 
my mother, my father, whoever you love the most is going to die tonight in a car crash, you wouldn't want to write it down. Do you think that's a good way of explaining that it? That is the, one of the best ways to describe it. And people who are spiritual and believe in crystals and charging their crystals on a, on a corner somewhere in a window might go, you might be manifesting it. Mm. And that's another really big thing with mm. OCD. We don't, we don't deal with the law of attraction and mm. this idea that whatever you think will come to, come to pass. And that's, that's another really big misconception with people with OCD. They listen so much to this manifestation idea and law of attraction that it can reinforce to them in their heads that I'm going to become my thoughts. Yeah. And there's a great Bible verse that I often say, as a man thinketh, so is he. And that's a Proverbs. And it's this idea that whatever you think in your head, you will become. And that's one of the verses that sat with me a lot when I was younger, that you have to think clean, pure thoughts almost. And I know that can really affect people. So yeah. it is a, one of the best ways to describe it. Yeah. It's interesting you mentioned religion growing up and you've, you've touched on it a little bit. But how else do you think that has affected your, your mental health as an adult or growing up? growing up in a certain environment? Well, I think the church quite often for my community, it, it's, it's a band-aid. It's a band-aid for a lot of the issues that we have. And I think that sense of hopelessness that came as a result of certain events throughout our experience and so much more, the church became this safe haven, it became a place where we held on to certain ideas and ideals. And I think it's one of the biggest bastions of culture for a lot of us. But I think at the same time, there's a lot of archaic, dinosaur views in so many different ways, if I'm going to be very honest. And I, so I grew up Seventh-day Adventist, and Seventh-day Adventism is, is a denomination of Christianity, but a lot of them won't ever want to admit that. It's slightly cultish. It's um, very conservative, obviously Christian. And just the way they see the world, it's not all n n necessarily bad, but they're not, I don't think they're very open to new ideas. And a lot of the work I want to do is to go back into the church and have certain conversations. And... If I had gone to my church and I had said, guys, I'm struggling with these thoughts, they honestly would try and pray for me. Mm. And I remember somebody who was um, just recently converted to Seventh-day Adventism, they had great intentions and they live with ADHD. And they sent me a video explicitly, basically saying that the devil had put these thoughts into my head. And I, again, there's a, there's a moment, there's always a moment for me where can I get, do I get angry or do I educate? And I always try to choose the education route because me being angry is not going to serve anyone. Easier said than done, though. It is, but I practice it. I really try to practice it yeah. because at the end of the day, offence is taken, not given. That's my mentality. I try to be as accountable and responsible as much as I can. Mm. Obviously, there's wider things at play and I can't control what other people do, but I try to control what happens with me. And that's just me personally. But I said to her, look, I live with OCD. I said, you may put it down to the devil. You may put it down to religion. And I said, luckily enough, I don't live with religious OCD because this could further trigger me. It's, a, I, it's an OCD that also, yeah, yeah definitely occurs And I said, OCD. but I appreciate you wanting to help in the ways you know how. But I said, I'd rather not have anything else from you. So I put my boundary up. But I think she, she respected it. She never sent me anything else. So mm. that's what I mean by a lot of it is to do with the devil and God, Jesus, sin in the world and so much more. And I think regardless where you sit, religious dogma needs to sometimes go because we 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 have we have secular treatment that triumphs over religious dogma and that's the kind of segue and that's the place that i'm in yeah yeah we've spoken a lot about how debilitating ocd is and you touched on the therapy that you received um can we talk a little bit about your recovery mm. um so you had the erp how quickly did you start to see an improvement in your mental health I think I saw an improvement in my mental health when I um, took psychedelics, when I was on the trial at Imperial College London, actually. Oh, okay. Tell us, tell us more yeah. about that. Um, so my, my, my mental health was improving. I was still living with the thoughts, usually when I would wake up straight away and so much more, but I was getting through it. I could cope with it. I had realised, but... So I'd, just to pick that, you were you were still having the thoughts, but yeah. you could kind of move on from them, yeah, so to speak. Yeah, it, it just didn't bother me. You didn't me. get stuck in the thoughts, which is when. Yeah, I didn't. Bit. I didn't ruminate. I didn't get anxious about it. And even right. if I did, I sat with it. Yeah. But I I had a lot of depersonalization and derealization for mm -hmm. a lot of people to understand that I was terrified. That I remember there was a week where I ate food and it had no taste, okay. as a result of derealization and depersonalization, mm -hmm. and that made me anxious. I would be eating porridge. And I'll be like, why is there no taste? I've put honey in it. I've put blueberries. I, could, I, I can laugh about it now. Yeah. That's 
I'm lucky to be where I am. Mm. And a lot of people who are going to be listening to this who maybe know people with OCD, send it to them because I want them to know they can recover and can, can, they can get so better. It's so important. And there's such good evidence behind our yeah. treatment as well. Yeah. So I enrolled onto... Uh, so Professor David Nutt is overseeing this trial with psilocybin because psilocybin has been known to have beneficial effects on OCD. There was a 2006 Harvard study that was done that okay. showed that psilocybin alleviates OCD symptoms. But everyone knows that Richard Nixon and all these other eras, they stopped any sort of drug research. So it's yeah. been, it's an emerging research now. And I'm writing a lot of exciting articles on decriminalization and legalization of cannabis, psychedelics, and so much more. Yeah. I have friends who are on ketamine trials out in the US, so that's another really exciting thing. Yeah, we've got quite a lot of podcasts if people want to listen to, to psychedelic treatments, yeah. So I was on this trial, and I, obviously I can't tell you too much about the trial for the sake of it. Is it not completed yet? It's then? not completed, right, but okay. I took psilocybin, and I would say since then, I've my OCD's been pretty much null and void. Okay. What happened? Was it during that moment? Was it an immediate effect? Did you have therapy while you were taking psilocybin? So I did integration therapy, which right. is obviously what you learn on a trip, you integrate into your everyday life. And I realized a lot of my, in my opinion, my OCD came off the fear of anxiety, not wanting to, I wanted to know everything. It came from perhaps maybe a lot of trauma. These are just my hypothesis. Mm. I don't ruminate on it. I'm I'm at peace with not it's knowing. It's best not to, be. to ruminate. Yeah, like I'm, I'm at peace with not knowing. But for me, it was gradual. For me, what psilocybin allowed me to do was to look inside of myself. And that there was at this there was a point when I was tripping when I saw this chain coming out of me. And I laugh about this to people, but because I think if you don't do psychedelics, it's hard to explain the feeling that happens in your mind. But I had this chain and I was pulling this chain out of me. And the two therapists I was talking to, um, I struggled to show physical affection, but there was this thought that said, hug them, you need it. And I would hug them, kiss them on the head, and I'd be like, I wanna, I'm finished with it now. I don't, I, I don't want it anymore. So this was rigid thinking. I had mm. quite a rigid thinking about the, uh, you know, certain things in the way that I was raised and so much more. But that trip taught me a lot about myself. And I would say since then, my OCD, as I said, has been pretty much null and void, but I think it was gradual. I think it was an accumulation in the sense of I journal every day. I My advocacy and activism is also a big part of my recovery to know I'm helping people. And I don't mm. run from anything anymore. If I'm scared, I go towards it because that is where I will grow the most. Yeah. I often say this to people, if you hide and you shy away, you take away a day in your future. Anxiety is allowed to be present. Anxiety is an evolutionary response. Yeah. You know, we're yeah. allowed to have it, but anxiety is not real. I just wanted to say, this sounds like it was a clinical trial. Um, we're not encouraging people to go yeah. out and just buy magic mushrooms of off the street not, no. um, to treat their OCD. Yeah. Please don't do that. You don't know what you're taking. Um, yeah, it's a caveat. <laughs> it's a big caveat. <laughs> yeah, definitely. But this is really interesting. And there's a lot of interesting ongoing trials, especially here at the IOPPM where we are today, which is exciting because this is our, my first podcast here, um, looking into psychedelics and the treatment and how they, those can help. I think MDMA as well. We talk about um, how that can help people with PTD, PTSD as well which is really, really interesting and exciting. You mentioned about your recovery. Would you say you are completely recovered from OCD? Or would you say it's an ongoing battle, but you've just learned to deal with the anxiety that comes with OCD? Well, it's no longer a battle because I don't go to the ring. Nice. I no longer fight. Nice. And I, I honestly no longer fight with it. I yeah. wake up and I accept that. The one big moment for me was accepting these thoughts will never go away. Mm that yeah. I'm gonna have the thoughts pop in every now and then, mm. and it can do what it wants to do. The brain is a storytelling machine. It does what it wants, it tells stories. I don't have to buy into every story hook, line and sinker. I can mm -hmm. put the story back on the shelf and walk out of the bookstore. That's mm. the best way I'd describe it. Wow, I think that's a great act. That's a great <laughs> act analogy. Sean Forrest, <laughs> trademark 2023. <laughs> but no, I would say, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's an ongoing journey for recovery, but I would say for the most part, I'm probably nearly fully recovered, I would say. I would say. But, but recovery looks different to everyone. Yeah, yeah. It, it looks incredible. Like, I'm not on antidepressants anymore. Mm -hmm. I weaned myself off antidepressants. And that was a nerve wracking thing because yeah. they took the thoughts, they took the intensity of the thoughts away. Yeah. But I've learned to live with it now. So I'm really lucky. I'm not on any anti antidepressants. I needed the antidepressants at the time. I'm not here to tarnish antidepressants. Uh, yeah. So I'm looking at other possible alternatives now for my 
recovery of anxiety and so much more. And just to say, were the antidepressants to treat your depression? Because we also know that there's evidence to say that antidepressants are actually for use to treat OCD. So mm-hmm. it's not actually the depression that they treat, although it can be. It's antidepressants are also a treatment for OCD. What were yours for? Or both, maybe? <laughs> I think they were for all three, dep- OCD, depression and anxiety. Yeah. I think because you can have OCD and not be anxious. Yeah. That's recovery. Whereas yeah. if you have OCD and anxiety, you've got OCD, right? Yeah. When you take away the two, you realize, oh, I've got OCD, but I'm no longer anxious and depressed. That's when I would say recovery really, really exists. But I would say at the time, it was probably for the anxiety, perhaps, mm. and the, probably the depression. Mm-hmm. And the depression was as a result of what was happening in my mind and in my life. And I look back and I realized I was penned in a breakdown. Mm. I think really and truly, for those five to six years around that, I was penned in a mental health breakdown. And when it came, it came full steam ahead. It mm. hit like a freight train. Mm. So yeah, I would say it was for probably all three, to be fair. I know we're, we're about to finish, and I'm kind of going back to the to the main part of our conversation. But just to get a real picture of, of what your life looked like during that time, you've explained what was going through your mind, but were you able to leave the house? Were you able to see friends? What What, what, what did your life look like when you were at your worst? Well, I didn't really have a life. I yeah. woke up and I'd sit on my sofa and want time to swallow me up. I could barely watch TV. I was stuck in my head all day long. I didn't want to eat. My friends would come around and I was just in another world most of the time. And my friend recently he even said to me, he said, he'd, he's never seen me so bad. He had never mentally ever seen me so bad. I was constantly very emotional because I thought that I was going to die mm. and I wanted to die. Mm. I did not want to be alive. There's no other way for me to put it, but I'm really thankful to be where I am now because if I allowed temporary feelings to make permanent decisions, I would have changed people's lives essentially for the for the worst ultimately. Suicide doesn't stop the pain, you're only really moving it. But at the time I describe it as I was living in hell, but there's a saying from Carl Jung, that I really relate to and it says, a tr- it is said a tree cannot reach to heaven unless its roots reach down to hell. Mm-hmm. And I mm-hmm. think that's kind of where I am. I think that's a great place to end on how you are so unwell and how well you are today. Is there anything else you want to say to our listeners before we wrap up? I'm delivering a TEDx talk actually at Imperial College London. Oh, wow, on psychedelics exciting. and the potential mental health revolution it will bring. I've got some exciting work coming out with OCD and mental health in general. It's it's an exciting time. So look out and see. Thank you so much for coming on, Sean. And I'm so pleased to hear your recovery story. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.